Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm broadcasting from Alabama on the road, so hopefully we're able to hear me pretty well. Um, in my job in the Air Force with unmanned aerial systems, I had a chance to coordinate and work with them in, in terms of search and rescue. So it's just a logical extension to be able to talk about UASs in agriculture. And I just want to give a shout out to Dan Robinson, who uh, works for Aggie Air for the last 10 years, who helped me with my slides and gave me a lot of information about what we're doing at Utah State since I've only been there for a year. But before we get started with uh, details, I want to go over the definitions. So I'll cover some of the basic definitions so that you know what we're talking about today. And then I'll go over the FAA rules. Wayne will follow me with a lot more about applications and implementation of these unmanned aerial systems. So the first definition is UAV. This is what you see a lot. It's unmanned aerial vehicle. This is the actual aircraft that flies. And so you're going to see this term as you study the UAVs. The second one is drone. This is what you hear about in the news all the time. The drones actually started in World War II where they started to use them as targets for aerial um, practice. And so this drone has, was fallen out of use for a while, but now that the hobbyists are out there, uh, this is what everybody calls a drone. Now, these could be the small things that you get at the hobby store to the military large drones. So drone is kind of a catch-all term that people are using today. Uh, unmanned aircraft, UA, is something that you'll see here and there. It's, um, it's almost not seen too much anymore. That's also the actual aircraft that's being flown. So when we talk about UAs, we're actually talking about the vehicle that's in the sky. UAS is the entire system, the unmanned aerial system. This includes the aircraft, any tr sensors, payloads, guidance systems, the ground control stations, the safety pilot who's monitoring. Um, everything that's involved with the UAS is including GPS. A lot of these UAVs can now operate autonomously using GPS signals and GPS location equipment. And so when we talk about UAS, we're talking about the entire system, not just the vehicle um, that's actually flying in the air. Small UAS, SUAS, this is something you'll see out there a little bit, not so much in agriculture, but these are these little ones that fly around, um, some as small as insects, and anything less than 55 pounds is considered SUAS. Most of the applications that you see for commercial and hobbyists are, fall under the SUAS category, which the FAA has classified now. Uh, the last definitions are RPA and RPV. These are mainly used in military applications, but remotely piloted aircraft, these are ones that actually um, are man in the loop. These are systems that require a human being to fly. Uh, examples are the Predator and Reapers, the MQ-1 and MQ-9. Um, the remotely piloted vehicle is equivalent. You see both of those as well. Some of the semi-autonomous ones are like the Global Hawk, the RQ-4. These ones actually have a capability to take off and fly their route and land, with almost no intervention by a human being whatsoever. So these are semi-autonomous where they have just uh, moments where they have to, to be uh, impacted by a intervention or a control by a man. Fully autonomous is some that we actually can see within agriculture where they are programmed to take off, they fly to their target areas, they do all their work and come back. And these fully autonomous systems are being developed and studied at both University of North Dakota Utah State and other universities, which you'll see on my last slide today. Some of the other definitions, just to be aware of as we talk about aviation, AGL is above ground level. Some of the limitations I'll talk about are in AGL, and that's different because realize up at Utah State, we're at you know, 5,000, 6,000 feet above sea level for ground level, whereas in some of the universities at sea level. So we always go by AGL. A certificate of authorization, COA. You're going to see that in the slideshow today, and that's just an agreement by the FAA authorizing an organization such as university or business to, to operate. A nautical mile, it's about 6,000 feet versus a statue mile, which is 5280, and the reason that we use nautical miles, it's a lot easier to do math um, versus trying to do the shorter. So when we talk about nautical miles, realize it's a little bit longer than a statue mile. And then NAS is another acronym you're going to talk about, uh, we'll talk about today, national airspace. This is the controlled airspace. Um, so when we're talking about national airspace, for the most part, we're talking about anything above 18,000 feet around airports, along the airways. These are like highways in the sky. So the national airspace is what we're going to talk about, the controlled airspace for UAVs. If there's no questions on the definitions, um, 
we're going to talk about some of the uses today, of course, in agriculture. Um, one of the ways Utah State University has been looking at this is through the Water Research Laboratory, and they're analyzing water retention and snowpacks. They're looking with different types of sensors. In this example here, they use a thermal sensor, which is measuring the temperatures, near infrared, which can look into through the trees and, and look at heat um, retention, and then the RGB, which is red, green, blue. And by combining these three sensors, they're able to, to look at a full spectrum and, and analyze a lot more water saturation. So when you look at agriculture, it's indirectly related to water in many different ways. Um, same with animals and, and other sensors you have. So you can see that this use uh, can directly apply to agriculture. One of the other ways we're doing it here at Utah State is a scientific data acquisition. So here we're looking at different types of sensors and pictures to look at ozone, water habitats, to see the growth and shrinkage of areas um, over the course of a year or years, um, river dynamics as they move and ebb and flow. So there's a great YouTube video you guys can watch at your leisure after this broadcast to see exactly how this is applying in, in today's use. Some of the other uses you're going to see, and most of your hobbyists follow here now, is this little quadcopter. You can get some of the more expensive ones for about $1,200 at Best Buy. And these ones here have a camera underneath it, and they can fly around. Um, usually you can get about 8 to 10 minutes of flight time on some of the upper end ones because they're the batteries, that's how long they last on a good charge. And so people are using these a lot to try to get up in the air and take pictures of their property or just to have some fun with them. The smaller ones you can get for Walmart for $40. And uh, these ones here, again, not quite as high definition camera, a little shorter flight time, maybe two to three to four minutes on some of them. Um, some of these are, are very inexpensive. And this is what the, the thousands and thousands are being sold every month uh, across the country are these little small hobby ones that you're going to see around. Um, I just want to do a little plug for education. You know, right now Utah State University is doing a big push with the high schools to get people interested in UASs, let them know what's going on. And in the next couple of years, we're going to be creating a bachelor's degree as part of this command and control concept. We have our aeronautic engineering department has been designing them for years um, with different composites and engines and materials. We actually want to look at the implementation. And you can see an example here of a drone zone where they put some netting up for safety. This is actually at an airport, the example here. And then they can fly the drones inside and do some competition. So, again, encouraging youth is part of the STEM education to see what's out there in aviation to prep them before they can come to universities. Um, here's a couple more videos that shows the examples uh, in lieu of today's presentation. I don't have time to be able to show them all. But there's a great video here that shows how we can educate kids and get them excited about this technology at an earlier age before they come to universities. Um, before I go into the United States chart, I wanted to show you a little bit about the different countries of the world. And some of the things to look at is that there is no consensus. Right now, a lot of the different countries have different rules. For example, um, for commercial operations in Australia, uh, there's about 200 operators, but you look in Denmark, there's only 20. And yet in Canada, there's over 1,000. So you can see that just the, the usage in some of these countries, the United States here, there's, there's tens of thousands, if not 100,000. Um, some of the rules, maximum altitude is interesting. Here in the United States, it's 400 feet for hobbyists. And you can see Canada's down to 295. Uh, it's up to 492 in France and Germany. But for the most part, you're going to see about 400 feet. You've got to say 100 feet away from people and buildings. Uh, Denmark is 500 feet. In the United States, they say 500 feet. You've got to be 500 feet from any populated areas um, just to make sure that you're not overflowing people. Um, some of the other restrictions you see not allowed at night, bad weather. Um, so right now in Australia, they have some special approval with training in the U.K., but for the most part, in the United States, no night flying of those. Insurance is a, a new rule proposal that hasn't gone through the FAA yet. It's required, you can see in Canada, Denmark, France, Germany, but not required in the UK and Australia is recommended. So right now in the United States, we don't have any hard rules, but the FAA is updating those as we speak today. Um, and this is just some of the, the differences. You can see as we talk about the rules, that there is no consensus. So let's look at some of the FAA rules that we have now implemented. The first one is if you're a hobbyist, you, you fly little model airplanes or quadcopters, you have to be line of sight, which means that you have direct visual 
of your UAS as it's flying. Whether it's a remote control airplane or a quadcopter, you've got to be watching it, including radio controlled aircraft. Make sure that you can see them. Uh, if it's under 5.55 pounds, you don't have to register it. So a lot of these little small ones, you don't. If it's between 0.55 and 55, you have to register it to make sure that the FAA knows about it. Now, there are a few exceptions. When you belong to an aero modeling organization like a hobby club, there's one up here in, in Logan, you can get some exceptions because they have their own little small airport where they fly. They have a, an area zoned off where they can fly these. So some of these um, miniature B-52s and other airplanes are well over 55 pounds. And they don't need to be certified or registered because they're part of that organization. Here's a thing right off the FAA website. This little slide kind of talks about some of the general rules for UAVs. Um, and again, you know, if you're just starting out of the program university, you fall under this category until you have your own COA. So they encourage you to take lessons, learn how to fly. So you're doing more than just, you know, trying to go up there. Some of these are very expensive airplanes anyway. Make sure that if you are within five nautical miles of an airport, you talk to them and let them know. Even though legally you can go out to two or three miles, they want to make sure that, that they know that you're flying out there. Um, and have fun with your, but make sure that you're in line of sight. Don't fly anything over 55 pounds. And make sure that you're not doing it for payment or commercial purposes, which we'll talk about shortly here. So for commercial drones, the max speed is 100 miles an hour, 55 pounds, and 500 feet. Remember, it's 400 feet for um, hobbyists, but up to 500 feet for commercial. The extra 100 feet is because they are certified. To be a commercial drone pilot, you actually have to have a commercial pilot's license. Now, unfortunately, even though this is depicted with the package, nothing's been approved. Sorry, Amazon, you're not able to fly yet. Um, but the other thing for commercial, you have to be 17 years old because that's the age to get a private pilot's license in commercial. So you got to make sure that you pass those tests and recurring tests and get an operating certificate. So in addition, the Transportation Security Administration, TSA, has to vet you as an operator so that you're able to operate a commercial a, uh, aircraft. That's another addition for commercial. So university, they may not fall into the commercial because it's under university. So there's some differences that they may be able to look at unless you're doing it for a project for somebody else where they're getting paid. Now, some of the limitations, despite what you see here with the drone over the water at the latest PGA event, you're not supposed to be flying over any um, sporting events, stadiums, air shows, uh, for hobby and recreation. So if it's a commercial operation, there's some limitations. And, for example, this drone is not over the people, it's over the water, so it's considered safe. Um, the regulation here, the 14 CFR 91.145, the temporary flight restrictions, it talks about over like a stadium or an NFL game, Major League Baseball game. When they do that, they have the temporary flight restrictions. Normally, 3,000 feet above ground level within three nautical miles of the event. Plus or minus an hour, you are not allowed to have any flying for safety. And guess what? UAVs fall into that restriction, so you got to stay out of that area unless like the Goodyear Blimp gets permission. So right now, a commercial operator can get permission to fly over those events. Uh, we talked about commercial operations that, that's not approved the Amazon yet, but you have to have a special airworthiness certificate in the experimental category. That's the first way to get a commercial operation so that your UAV gets certified and now anybody can buy your vehicle and use it in that category. Um, a lot of research and development, crew training surveys of pipelines, or high-tension power lines are being done right now by UAVs that have been certified this way. The second one is to get a neighborhood certificate in a restricted category. And this limits it for a specific purpose or specific use. So rather than a blanket approval for your type of UAV, it's for a specific one. And let's say you build one for a university and it's a one-of-a-kind, then of course you wouldn't get a, a generic certificate. It would be a specific one here. And the third one is an exemption. This is where you can get a COA, and this is what the university has been doing for the last several years, waiting for the rules. I know Utah State University as well as others have had these um, exemptions so that they were able to continue to fly while they were waiting for the rules to come through. The Section 333 exemption that I just talked about, it's underneath the Secretary of Transportation. And so you have to be able to get exemptions for what you're doing. However, if you do get this exemption, you can actually fly within the national airspace, which means in 
the areas of airports and controlled airspace or up high. And this is for like border patrol. This is for uh, research and development for, you know, some high altitude operations. You are able to operate in there, but there's some additional restrictions which are beyond the scope of today's briefing about being able to have a GPS on board so that they can detect and determine where you are. So right now you can fly um, civilian UAS operations uh, but not with any five nautical miles of an airport. So if you're doing civilian operations that are not commercial, you need to make sure that you are outside the five nautical miles of airport just because you need to deconflict with airplanes that are flying. Now, as I said, if you're gonna be a commercial drone operator, you actually need to have a commercial pilot's license. And so you have to be able to do that. If your UAS, the aircraft, or any part of the system is issued an airworthiness certificate, in other words, it's a type of airplane that's certified by the FAA, the private pilot certificate is required to fly it because it's now a certificated aircraft. The hobbyists don't don't uh, fall in that, but some of the bigger ones, of course, and the commercial ones will be required currently to have a private pilot certificate and a commercial license if you're doing it for hire. As we talk about public UAS operations and uh, the universities fall into this, the federal law defines UAS as an aircraft. So therefore it can operate in the national airspace system and the circular is the one that identified that, but you need to have that COA that I talked about. So if you're gonna go up into the national airspace, you need to have a specific aircraft in a specific area for a specific purpose. You just can't do it spontaneously. You have to get approval for it every single time so they can load other airplanes where you're gonna be and let them know to look out because these airplanes are so small that they won't be visible to many of the airliners because they're flying a lot slower as well. And they do this so they can define a block of airspace so that it's a protected airspace where you're flying to keep all the manned airplanes separate from these UAVs that are flying out there. This is an example of the certificate of waiver that I pulled off the Utah State University website for the Water Research Laboratory. And you can see here in this section, so it's Aggie Air UAS in Class G in airspace so we have a code that says at or below 2,200 feet above the ground level, not to exceed 11,000 mean sea level. So because we're so high altitude, they can actually fly above the mountains around going to and from the areas of um, Fish Lake as they're going up there to do some water research. And this is in the jurisdiction of the Salt Lake Air Route Traffic Control Center, ARTCC. So the big center will be able to control and we have to tell them where we are to take and flip from other airplanes. And this is just one example of a COA, and you can find these other COAs um, on the university websites because they're required to be made public in the name of transparency. Now, the blanket COA I talked about right now, if you wanted to fly operations at a university and develop a program, you can start that right away with some of these off-the-shelf products. Any flight below 400-foot AGL, above ground level, but not within five miles, not a miles of an airport with a control tower. Now, if you're like us up in Logan Cash or in a small a place where there's no control tower, the other rules apply. If there's a published instrument approach, you have to be three nautical miles away. But if it doesn't have an instrument approach or a control tower, you can be within two nautical miles of that airport and not have any restrictions to be able to fly if there's any um, agricultural animals or crops that need to be studied or evaluated. If it's a heliport, you see those are a lot of hospitals and other areas, you also have to stay two nautical miles away from those. So you can see that uh, even though there's thousands of small airports throughout the country, there's still a lot of ways to fly near them without flying over them or through their airspace. As I said, there's no special airspace for unmanned aerial systems. So right now, if there's a temporary flight restriction over an aircraft accident or some other incident, the FAA places a no-fly zone above that. UASs cannot go into those. Excuse me, they have to have special authorization. Even if the news channel hires a third party, those same laws still apply. So here's a question. This is just kind of for fun. People say, what governs the airspace over my property? Well, we'd like to university, you have all these crops, so these agriculture fields, you may have some uh, meadows for your cattle. Well, guess what? That airspace over your property is not owned by you. Despite the gentleman who a few uh, months ago decided to take out a drone over his property that was, we thought, spying, you can't shoot a weapon inside city limits, um, but how does this apply to your privacy? Well, in agriculture, there are some laws that, that are um, applicable. 
For example, many states have a law that you cannot film or audio record a farm without the owner's consent. So you can't drive next to a pasture and record the number of animals or their health or listen to their bleeding or anything like that. So a drone, that law would protect the the agriculture uses of that property that they use. Someone else can't fly drones over them because, again, they can't film or audio or record anything over your property, which includes university fields or agriculture fields that are protected by those laws. But yet there's not specific laws for drones yet. Um, another thing that is great to learn, um, if you're going to start a UAV program and wondering what the airspace looks around where you're located, get the Before You Fly app. This app is free on the FAA website, the Federal Aviation Administration website, and it will show you all the airports. For example, this is the area over San Francisco. It shows you the rings around every airport, and if you remember, five nautical mile rings. So those five nautical mile rings around all those control towers. These are uncontrolled airports, which means there's not towers, so much smaller rings over there so you can get closer. And it kind of shows you. One of the ideas of this app is to help people deconflict from powered flight. Um, you have a future um, a flight planning mode called planner mode. So you can actually plan a flight from point A to point B, and it'll tell you if you're going to be going near any airports and how to deviate around them. It can filter, so you can set, I don't want to see the big fields or small fields or certain elevations. And there's also links on here to all the other FAA websites to be able to look at the resources to better be prepared to fly your U.S. as in your area. So I recommend you at least go to this website if you want to start a program by a university, you look at that. Now, as a university, there's some other applications besides just agriculture that are secondary but support. And one of them is drone maintenance, having a program to be able to look at how to maintain these systems and how to operate them. If you're going to be flying into research and development, someone has to maintain these to inspect them, make sure they can fly. And students can be incorporating this as well. So it's a way to make an educational process, everything from wiring and engine maintenance to making repairs to the vehicle. Even with designs, maybe there's a specific application, bring your students in, you can look at programs to design new vehicles. And that's what they've done at the Utah State University Water Lab, is looking at off-the-shelf products, but then adapting sensors to be able to use these over their properties. Some great opportunities there. Um, flight planning, again, you can look at taking the same principles you teach your, your, your powered flight students to a UAV and they still can look at the command and control and how you implement and how you operate these UAVs. And then even business and law, there's a whole new world of litigation just waiting for UAVs. And right now when you look at UAVs, it's such a new concept that the laws and rules aren't caught up. So pay, pay attention over the next few years, you're going to see a lot of opportunities change. So what's the future? If you want to look at jobs, um, a UAS pilot, Right now, 85 to 115,000 for experienced UAS pilots in the country. Um, people are doing the payloads, just operating the payloads and sensories and imagery. You can look at the, the salaries there. The consultants, these are people that are considered experts in their field. Uh, they can make quite a bit. So a lot of your military drone pilots and coordinators are looking out in industry as, as they're growing. And again, here's a website for the FAA to look up the rules and policies that are changing almost on a weekly basis. And this is something off the FAA website as well. It talks about 40 uses for drones. And you can see in security, for example, there's a lot of surveillance, a lot of security over properties. And this is something that agriculture is definitely going to look at because how can you monitor all your fields and your animals out there 24 hours a day? It gets very expensive when you have people on patrol. Where yet UASs, they can go over any kind of terrain. And as long as the weather's good, they can get out there and monitor to stay aloft for long periods of time. We have some UAVs in Utah State that will have over three hours of loiter time over some of their areas. So it's a great opportunity to, to reduce costs. And the last slide for me before I turn it over to Wayne is these are just the universities right now that are working with the FAA in some aspect of UAVs. Um, some of it's research and development, some of it is training education, some of it is more than just agriculture. But these are the universities right now that are on the the forefront of, of the UAB and UAS movement in our country. And so if you have some questions, these, these universities have got some great programs going, uh, some of them for many years.